Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar titled Winning the Battle but Losing the War, Challenges of Cancer and Its Therapies in Heart and Lung Transplant Recipients. Uh, my name is Greg Fishbein. Uh, I am a professor or assistant professor of pathology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers for joining us today, and I'd like to thank all of the audience members for joining us. Um, just a reminder to stay muted uh, while the speakers are, are, are presenting. You can submit questions via the chat, and after each speaker, we'll have about five minutes to uh, field questions um, via the chat. Um, without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Dr. Robert Federa, uh, a very good friend of mine and mentor uh, who is an associate professor at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, and his talk is titled Cardio Cardiopulmonary Failure as a Sequela of Cancer Therapies. Bobby, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And I, you can see my screen okay? Yes, looks good. Perfect. <clears throat> so thank you uh, to the Society for the invitation, and, and thank you to Dr. Uh, Pizzuto and, and Dr. Fishbein the Younger for, for inviting me to give this talk on cardiopulmonary failure as a sequela of cancer therapies. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. This will be our, our roadmap today, so we'll give a brief introduction, uh, and then we'll talk about the um, kind of key, uh, therapies for cancer um, and how they affect the, the heart and lungs. We'll go through radiation therapy, more conventional chemotherapies, newer targeted chemotherapies and immunotherapies, uh, and then we'll summarize at the end. So starting with a very brief introduction, uh, cancer therapies can cause irreversible structural damage to the heart and lungs uh, that occasionally can necessitate uh, a transplant of, of one of those organs. And in patients who already have a heart or lung transplant, these therapies can damage the existing allograft. So it kind of can hit both. And the mechanisms we'll talk about largely will, uh, will affect whether one has a native organ or a transplanted organ. Cancer therapies can also affect the cardiovascular and pulmonary systems via uh, physiologic changes. So nothing that's going to lead to a structural change, but something that can, in the moment that therapy is given, give rise to cardiopulmonary failure. And again, applying to both native organs and allografts. The important of, the, of this topic is that when you look at individuals who have survived their cancer, cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death, which is not all that surprising. Cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death in, in everybody, but it's really enriched in, in patients who have survived their, uh, their cancer. And the kind of the, the flip side of this is as we've gotten better at keeping patients alive and healthy longer after heart and lung transplantation, cancer does bubble to the top as an important cause of death for, for patients. And so the therapies that we'll talk about are often brought to bear on patients who have uh, heart and lung transplants. So with that introduction, we'll uh, talk about radiation therapy and specifically radiation therapy to the, to the thorax. Radiation therapy exerts its effects by inducing DNA damage to uh, produce lethal effects on cancer cells. However, normal cells and normal tissues are also damaged. This uh, radiation can also, in the cardiovascular system, lead to endothelial cell dysfunction. Generally, uh, acutely, that can lead to thrombosis and, and vascular leak. The tissue damage that ensues because of radiation therapy, especially in the heart and lungs, is going to induce the wound healing response and like everything in the heart and lungs, it's going to heal with inflammation and eventually fibrosis. The tumor that we think of most kind of closely associated with radiation therapy to the thorax is Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, treatment for that often involved mantle radiation. So you can see here uh, kind of the mantle field in gray. If you ask the hematopathologist, they would say, oh, yeah, that's going to hit all the lymph nodes. If you ask the cardiovascular pathologist, that's going to hit all of the it's going to hit the heart and all of the great vessels. So the field is going to be um, to cure the cancer is going to end up affecting the, the heart and cardiovascular system. We also see radiation therapy being used for unresectable other thoracic malignancies, lung cancers, thymic tumors in particular, where the heart and lung may be in the radiation field. The good news, the glass half full part of this is that uh, the incidence of these effects is probably going to decrease over time as uh, the radiation oncologists are better at targeting therapies and with newer approaches uh, and established approaches, even like, um, like proton therapy, they're able to better conform their radiation to the, to the tumors. 
So we'll look at some uh, of radiation effects on, uh, on the heart and lungs, divided them into kind of early effects and late effects. The early effects on the heart with radiation therapy generally give rise to a fibrinous pericarditis. So there's very kind of faint granular appearance, which histologically is just fibrin on the epicardial surface and on the parietal pericardial surface here um, in, these, uh, you know, in these specimens. The late effects, which is what we think of much more, uh, more frequently of radiation therapy on the heart in particular, this can occur years to even decades after uh, radiation therapy, and it's the manifestation of the wound healing and fibrotic process and can affect all aspects of the heart, including the pericardium, where we'll, we see you know, a fibrous, a scarring pericarditis that can lead to constrictive physiology, can give interstitial fibrosis within the myocardium itself that can lead to a restrictive physiology and also with systolic dysfunction um, and arrhythmias that can generate from these areas around the fibrosis. Valves will uh, suffer fibrosis and can calcify, leading to either insufficiency or stenosis or both. Uh, and then in the vasculature, the coronary arteries and aorta can have uh, accelerated atherosclerosis that can lead to ischemic heart disease. And fibrosis around the, the conduction system can, uh, can give rise to heart block. So just a couple of pathologic examples. Here's a, a nice pathologic example, poor for the patient of, um, of fibrosis. Um, of, of fibrous pericarditis, you can see a little bit of the cut edge of the pericardial reflection here up around the aorta, how thick it is. And on cross-section, you could see here in the inferior portion and all the way around that thick pericardium, it's going to lead to a constrictive physiology. When we look at valves, so we're sitting in the left atrium here looking down at the mitral valve, you could see fibrosis of the leaflets and, and some degree of retraction here, calcification of the leaflets. This, this mitral valve is not going to move particularly well and was both stenotic and regurgitant. Um, also in the myocardium here, you could see in the left atrium, there's areas of fibrosis and calcification secondary to, to radiation damage. And finally, in the, in the vasculature, in coronary arteries, we see accelerated atherosclerosis. Um, the atherosclerosis can look a little different than kind of standard issue atherosclerosis. It tends to be a little less lipid rich than a, um, a standard atherosclerotic plaque, a little bit more fibrotic, but any type of lesion can occur uh, secondary to radiation. And, uh, and on the right here, you could see a patient had a thymic malignancy and, and was radiated um, in the anterior mediastinum. And so the aortic arch and the arch vessels were in the radiation field, really severe, ulcerating, ugly looking atherosclerosis. Uh, and then near where this line was, seems to be the break point and uh, just kind of mild atherosclerosis, although some mature plaques more distal to that. When we think about radiation therapy in the lungs, acutely, similar to the heart, it tends to be a fibrinous process, either fibrinous pleuritis or diffuse alveolar damage with hyaline membranes in the vasculature along with vascular fibrosis. And the late effects tend to be fibrotic in the pleura, in the lung itself, around the airways uh, and the vessels. The other issue with radiation therapy in the chest, thinking about this audience for uh, ISHLT, is it can lead to a lot of fibrosis in the chest, and that can complicate the ability to do a heart transplant or a lung transplant later on. Just some, uh, again, nice pathologic examples of what we can see in radiation therapy. Uh, the image on the left here shows really dense pleural fibrosis along with uh, significant uh, interstitial fibrosis within the lung. This was a patient who got radiated for a lung cancer, and the, the line here demarcates uh, where the radiation field was, again, thick in pleura compared to the rest of the pleura here, and really dense interstitial fibrosis. Microscopically, these tend to be very bland appearing lesions, especially late. This is an example of pleural fibrosis. You can see the elastic uh, network here of the visceral pleura, dense fibrosis of uh, of the pleura and some subpleural fibrosis, fibroelastosis here as well. In the interstitium of the lung, we see um, fibroelastosis and thickening of the alveolar walls. The alveolar spaces may be slightly uh, enlarged be, by, uh, just by retraction, um, but again, a generally a very bland but densely fibrotic process. The airways can be affected. We can see fibrosis around small airways, giving rise to a chronic bronchiolitis-like picture and some obstructive physiology. And within the vasculature, medial hypertrophy, intimal proliferation, and thrombosis. Here, this likely represents uh, a vessel that had been thrombosed and recanalized now. 
um, after, uh, after radiation therapy. Moving to conventional chemotherapy, the one we think about most affecting the heart are the anthracyclines, such as uh, adriamycin uh, and also taxanes uh, like paclitaxel and taxol, although these tend to, the taxanes tend to be more problematic when given with anthracyclines. And anthracyclines, the way they work is they generate reactive oxygen species that cause DNA damage, uh, protein carbonylation, lipid peroxidation, and general oxidative stress in cancer cells, but also normal cells. Um, they also intercalate, the anthracyclines do, into DNA, and they inhibit topoisomerase 2, which is a DNA repair protein. In inhibition of this protein can lead to P53 activation pathways and mitochondrial oxidative stress pathways that can lead to apoptosis of cells, including uh, cardiac myocytes, in addition to cell death from uh, reactive oxygen species generation. Generally, the uh, anthracyclines are well tolerated up to a particular dose, cumulatively over the lifetime of a patient. So the, the heart in, tends to remember uh, that it's gotten uh, anthracyclines before. But even below this, uh, this limit of 550 milligrams per meter squared, even at lower doses, one can see uh, cardiotoxicity, especially in older patients, in patients with underlying cardiovascular disease, including patients who have had heart transplant. Uh, and with, as with a lot of therapies, when it's given in combination with other radiation therapy or other chemotherapies uh, can occur at lower doses, the toxicity can. What we see under the microscope, uh, this is a particularly um, kind of florid case where we do see myocyte vacuolization even on the H&E. We see interstitial fibrosis, but the myocytes don't seem to be particularly enlarged. Um, within the, um, the way we assess these as, as pathologists is with, uh, with thick sections from glutaraldehyde fixed material, and the more normal appearing myocytes will have this darker purple uh, appearance owing to the sarcomeric structures, the protein structures within the, within the cardiac myocytes. But you'll notice that many of these uh, cardiac myocytes are extraordinarily pale um, because of myofibrillar lysis. So we've lost the sarcomeric elements within, uh, within these cardiac myocytes. We uh, in, also just in passing, there is some interstitial fibrosis here that we see in the, um, in the heart. By EM, we see cardiac myocytes with just a few wisps of the myofibrils left behind, uh, and the cell often has maybe some glycogen, some edema, and, uh, and the mitochondria left behind. Occasionally, we will see myelin whorls like this. Um, we score these on the Billingham scoring system, and just, again, for this audience, um, same uh, Billingham as, as Dr. Margaret Billingham. She came up with, uh, with this scoring system. Um, uh, Dr. Billingham was the, the president of ISHLT back in 1990, uh, the first female to hold that role, and, and as far as I know, the first pathologist who have held that role of being president of the society um, there. She uh, was awarded with the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award in, in 2010 for her contributions largely to the uh, ISHLT scoring system for heart transplant rejection. Moving on to, to targeted therapies uh, for cancer, um, these we, we think of as being more specifically directed at molecules that are involved in cell cycle regulation, um, such as the growth factor receptors, other second messenger signals, epigenetic regulators of, um, of, of the DNA of the, the uh, chromatin and chromosomes, uh, as well as um, molecules that can inhibit apoptosis and other metabolic regulators, uh, in addition to molecules that can uh, inhibit angiogenesis. We'll come to checkpoint inhibitors uh, in a second. These targeted therapies we uh, are, are ones that one that we have heard of, certainly. Um, so trastuzumab uh, going against HER2 can cause decreased ejection fraction and heart failure. These are used in patients with breast cancer largely. But it turns out that can give decreased ejection fraction and heart failure uh, largely because the HER2 pathway on cardiac myocytes seems to be important in general myocyte homeostasis and correcting the um, kind of wear and tear that occurs on a, a daily basis with the, with the myocardium. We tend not to see cardiac structural changes like we see in, in others. This tends to be a functional uh, defect. The VEGF-targeted uh, therapies, such as bevacizumab, um, are targeting the endothelial cells and inhibiting angiogenesis. They also, not surprisingly, have cardiovascular toxicities, including uh, leading to hypertension and thrombosis. 
the VEGF targeted therapies lead to inhibition of nitric oxide production by the endothelial cells, hence the hypertension and inhibition of prostacyclin production, hence the thrombosis and inhibition or um, kind of harming the endothelial cells ability to be that nice uh, nature's container for blood. And it turns out that patients who get these targeted therapies who do develop hypertension, they tend to do better from the tumor outcome uh, standpoint. So it's a marker that the drug seems to be working um, physiologically. Again, no cardiac structural changes we see with VEGF targeted therapy. And the last of the uh, targeted therapies that I'll discuss, the most kind of the broadest group are the small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Osimertinib is, is probably the one you have heard of most recently for EGFR inhibition. Tyrosine kinases, as you saw on the, the slides before, are critical to many, many homeostatic processes, not just cell growth and, and division. And the current medications, even though they may be billed as an EGFR blocker, they're not entirely biologically specific, so they're dirty and they tend to hit multiple targets at different, uh, at different levels. Again, no cardiac structural changes, but patients on targeted therapies can have myriad cardiovascular um, uh, effects such as QT prolongation, hypertension, uh, reduced ejection fraction with heart failure, um, and sometimes uh, even acute coronary syndromes. In the lung, we do see um, interstitial pneumonitis somewhat commonly, unfortunately, with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and it's something to, uh, to keep an eye on, but generally does not progress beyond just the inflammatory process. There will be more of these novel targeted therapies that we will see in our careers, and it's important as pathologists to keep an eye out for them uh, as they occur. And lastly, we'll uh, just briefly touch on immunotherapy. And when we think of immunotherapy, most commonly the drugs that come to mind are the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, but there are other types of immunotherapies that can stimulate the immune system to fight against cancer. So monoclonal antibodies that will bind to antigens on cancer cells. Uh, we use adoptive cell transfer. This is the CAR T cell therapy uh, where we modify, um, we take a patient's T cells, modify them, in the lab, give them back to the patient for a, a better cell, a tumor cell killing response in vaccines and even good old fashioned cytokines can upregulate the immune system. All of these therapies can be really challenging to use in immunosuppressed transplant recipients because you're kind of going against what you would want for the health of the organ in order to treat the cancer. And also in patients with pre existing autoimmune diseases giving these immunotherapies can wake up the immune system and, and kind of cause a recrudescence of their uh, autoimmune disease. Um, not to delay, uh, belabor this, because this audience is familiar with these, uh, but tumor cells can upregulate PDL1 that activates PD1 on a T cell that basically turns off the T cell's ability to kill the tumor cells. It's a protective mechanism for the tumor cells. The drugs that we use, anti-PDL1 and anti-PD1, um, stop the tumor cell from using this off switch and allow the T cells to, uh, to kill the tumor cells. Upstream at the level of antigen presentation, CTLA4 is a molecule on T cells that's an inhibitory receptor. Um, if this is engaged, the antigen won't generate a strong T cell response. We can use anti-CTLA4 blocking agents to, uh, to allow the stimulatory signals to override and lead to, to tumor cell death. The immune checkpoint inhibitors, we do see um, changes in the, in the lungs and the heart. So this is an example of, of a mild, you believe it or not, milder response with interstitial pneumonitis, um, and then more severe responses such as uh, hyaline membrane formation and acute alveolar damage can, can occur leading to um, significant um, problems for the recipient's uh, respiratory system. And this is an example of a case where the patients were patients underlying autoimmune disease woke back up in the setting of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So a patient who had GPA um, developed new lung lesions that were, uh, were found to be GPA uh, in addition to having nice vasculitis. So the immune checkpoint inhibitors aren't going just against cancer, they're waking up the immune system more generally. And in the heart, we think of uh, the cardiovascular toxicities in terms of myocarditis often pericarditis, and then vasculitis and, and thrombosis. There are also electrical uh, issues that can happen with, with the heart with these, um, with these immune checkpoint inhibitors. So uh, just to show you what these look like, again, pericardial effusions and fibrinous pericarditis, similar to what I showed you in the early radiation uh, effect. 
and then myocarditis, often it's lymphocytic uh, with, with cell death and a, a lymphocytic infiltrate here. Occasionally, the more severe forms can actually have, have giant cell features. And then within the vasculature, this is just an example of a patient who had had uh, polymyalgia rheumatica, had had a bout of giant cell arteritis a decade ago with immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, that woke back up and uh, developed a new, um, new bout of, uh, of GCA. So just a kind of a final word, some final words. So all modalities of the current cancer therapies have the potential to cause cardiopulmonary failure through either structural abnormalities or physiologic alterations, and the specifics depend on the particular medications. Combined therapeutic regimens can have additive or synergistic effects, both anti-tumor killing, but also can, uh, can be synergistic in terms of their side effect profile. Uh, immunotherapy um, is, is a, a great new uh, new type of anti-cancer therapy, but for the heart and lung transplant population can be problematic. And again, as pathologists, I think in, in looking at elucidating the side effects and mechanisms for these for both existing therapies and what's coming down the uh, pike will be important for us to stay kind of to stay vigilant. So thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take, take questions in the chat or, uh, or elsewhere. Thank you, Dr. Padera. That was a very comprehensive overview. Um, uh, I'm, I'd like to open it up for questions, but before I do, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Federica uh, Pizzuto, who um, uh, will also join me in, uh, in taking questions. So you may type them into the chat or you may um, actually unmute and uh, ask your questions. I see actually one, chest, uh, one question in the chat from Dr. Roden. Uh, thank you so much for that great discussion on this quite complex topic. I'm wondering what is the outcome of patients who were heart transplanted after radiation, given the hostile chest, which likely uh, includes modified aortic walls, et cetera? So I don't know. So that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I don't have, have data uh, off the top of my head. I can tell you anecdotally that um, we have had anastomotic issues with um, you know, with anastomosis, especially with, with the aorta, as you suggest there. Um, and it also may be that these patients are declined for transplant at the kind of at an upfront stage. So they never kind of um, get the ability to have a heart because the, the surgeons feel that um, the, the risk would be too great to do the procedure. I'd like to ask a question regarding uh, the adriamycin in the heart. The, the myocytes appear small, as you mentioned, but can you comment on the overall size of the heart? The overall size of the heart, when we see these at, at explant, they, they vary. They tend to be less large than you see in a typical, like a genetic dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, they tend to be more fibrotic, um, you know, kind of more stiff and, and can have a more diastolic dysfunction look to them. Um, and it may be that the, the fibrosis is, is basically leading the patient to run into trouble earlier at a lower heart weight because of the fibrosis than what you would kind of typically expect with hypertrophy that you may see as part of a, a dilated cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, so the heart, a lesser heart weight doesn't necessarily mean that the heart is better functioning in the setting of, certainly in the setting of, of adriamycin. Thank you. I have also a, a question uh, that is more uh, a suggestion for young pathologists because uh, I think that when uh, we deal with, with these uh, tissue samples, we usually see samples taken from patients that uh, have been already treated, for example, and sometimes it can uh, hide or alter some histological details. So I was wondering if there is something that we should care more about to say that it is a sequela of the treatment and not, for example, um, a condition that already existed before the cancer or uh, um, eventually um, associated with uh, uh, the progression of the neoplasia. No, it's, a, it's a great question and a, a great question for the for the group. And I think for um, in in kind of how I, I interact with the the cardiologists here, it does tend to be a kind of a clinical pathologic correlation, like a lot of what we see in in lung disease, where knowing that the patient um, 
you know, decompensated after their, you know, after their chemotherapy or after radiation therapy is probably a better indication that the chemotherapy had something to do with it rather than a specific pathologic finding. Um, that's at least been in, in my, you know, kind of in, in my, um, experience. The exception to that would be the inflammatory processes that you may see with checkpoint inhibitor my, myocarditis or other kind of autoimmune processes where uh, you can more easily temporally time the, uh, the lesions to, uh, to a particular therapy. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. I appreciate and appreciate the invitation. Thank you. And uh, after this uh, really interesting presentation and uh, this discussion, let's move to the second presenter, who is uh, Dr. Katarina Vasile. Uh, Dr. Vasile completed her medical degree at the University of Berlin, and uh, she announced the medical expertise and straight and collaboration projects uh, via several observerships and fellowships at really international specialized centers in heart and lung disease. She is now a senior consultant in histopathology at the uh, Royal Brampton Hospital in uh, London. And uh, I will turn the stage to Dr. Vasilev uh, for uh, her presentation entitled De Novo Viral Related Malignancies in Lung and Heart Allographs. Please, Katarina. All right. Can you see my slides? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much um, for, to the society for the invitation and um, to the organizers for putting this fantastic program together. And my sincerest apologies uh, for not being able um, to switch on my camera today. Um, I have been challenged uh, to speak about novel virus associated malignancies. Um, in heart and lung transplant recipients. And I'm going to structure my talk uh, focusing on different pathologies of the most commonly encountered viruses with malignant potential, uh, focusing on the lung lesions uh, because um, they are more prevalent. And I'm going to address an update on the PTLD classification system. Um, from a um, the pathologist's perspective, this topic is quite challenging. Um, even though postpulmonary and cardiac manifestation of infectious diseases is frequently encountered in other grafts um, and represents the leading cause of death up to five years after heart and lung transplantation, um, the most commonly encountered infections are, according to autopsy studies, bacterial, mainly involving the lung. Um, unfortunately, the ISHLT registry has, due to restrictions on collection of patient-derived data, not been updated recently, and recently means uh, seven years uh, or five years, and further, the data are mainly based on uh, clinical findings. And the clinical findings show that only a small percentage of heart and lung transplant recipients succumb to malignancies in the um, early um, post-transplant period whereas malignancy is the leading cause of death almost um, in every fourth cardiac allograft recipient five years after transplant. Um, the most commonly encountered tumors are visceral and skin carcinomas and post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. Um, Unfortunately, the ISHT death statistics is not based on autopsy data. Um, single autopsy studies have shown a significant discordance between clinical and hist histopathological diagnosis, amounting to up to 30%. Um, so therefore, it cannot be excluded that a transplant-related malignancy is being underdiagnosed. Um, in our daily practice, de novo viral-related malignancies are extremely rare and um, the diagnosis remains challenging on cytological or histological examination, in particular in uh, small samples as endomarcardial or transbronchial biopsies. Um, and, and in addition, um, we are still lacking international definition for infections uniquely related to coagulal or thoracic transplant with the exception of Chagas disease and toxoplasmosis. Um, the most commonly diagnosed virus um, in surveillance biopsies is CMV, um, which appears to lack cancerogenic potential, but the most extensively studied virus-associated malignancy is Kaposi sarcoma. Uh, 
And a Kaposi sarcoma is a low-grade angioproliferative tumor in patients that are immunodeficient um, and has been first described um, in relation to HIV. The disease was named after Moritz Kaposi, which was actually a Hungarian dermatologist who first described it in 1972 um, as idiopathic multiple pigmented sarcoma of the skin. Um, HHV8 um, infection is required for the development of uh, Kaposi sarcoma, but um, not all infected persons develop the disease. Um, it presents with multiple red lesions anywhere on the skin or mucosal membranes. However, it can become more extensive involving the lymph nodes and visceral organs, especially the gastrointestinal tract and the lung. Um, the lung is particularly susceptible in lung transplant patients, as demonstrated in this uh, single center study by a French group. Nevertheless, um, rare cases involving the heart and the pericardium have been described, and these are anecdotal mainly. Um, also, Kaposi sarcoma is always caused by human herpes virus 8. There are four main clinical forms of disease, and we are going to focus on the iatrogenic version, as it is the result of drug treatment causing immune suppression, often associated with transplants. And the biopsy of the lesion um, allows for a definite diagnosis, um, and all four clinical forms show identical histological features, um, as shown in this um, case. The sarcoma is composed of fascicles of spindle cells. It's mass forming. Here's an example of the lung, the only case I could find in the literature, uh, which um, beautifully depicts uh, actually um, the transition from the lesion to the um, lung. Um, and usually there is only subtle vessel, vessel formation in the form of slit-like spaces. And uh, be aware that on cross-section, the slit-like spaces appear like um, holes. Um, the sarcoma colleagues have reported that immunohistochemistry for a vascular marker is um, often not equivocal as HHV8 can downregulate CD31 expression, um, but still the diagnostic workup should include the vascular markers as CD31, CD34, as well as the proliferation index key 67 and features of bleeding, extravasation of red blood cells or hemodesiderine depositions are helpful in establishing the diagnosis of more solid tumors. Um, the main differential diagnosis um, is low-grade angiosarcoma. Nevertheless, on the contrary to angiosarcoma, uh, Kaposi sarcoma uh, cells are much more uniform and the neoplastic cells are devoid of uh, severe pleomorphism. Immunostochemistry for HH38, which is um, LANA1, is extremely helpful in establishing the diagnosis. Um, another clue is that um, plasma cells are almost always um, there. But the same diagnostic criteria apply in the lung as for other sites. So um, we may ask, is it primary or is it a secondary tumor? So with the HIV pandemic, clinicians suggested that HIV alone may not be causative of Kaposi sarcoma, as hemophiliacs infected with HIV via blood transfusion developed seldomly Kaposi sarcoma. Um, using an advanced genomic analysis, a method called representational difference analysis, I've never heard of it before, uh, which is a form of subtractive hybridization, um, HHV8 could be isolated by Pat Moore and Yang Chang. And by 1996, when the HHV8 uh, genome was completely sequenced, it became clear that the virus that was derived from an endothelial neoplasm actually sorted with the lymphotropic family, phylogenetically. So once it became evident that the normal reservoir of HHV8 is in fact the B cell, um, all the lymphoproliferative diseases have been studied for the presence of HHV8, and in consequence, a number of HHV8-related pathologies were discovered. And here we see one of uh, one entity, which is a primary effusion um, lymphoma. Um, and I'm just going to discuss the most commonly encountered um, in the transplant patient common, um, uh, cohort. So the primary effusion um, lymphoma is a B cell lymphoma, and the tumor arises solely in serosal spaces, including the pleura and the pericardium. It is called primary as no other malignancy whatsoever is associated with the tumor. And the bone marrow and lymph nodes are generally normal, and there is no lung or abdominal malignancy history associated with the effusion. 
So fusion contains monoclonal immunoblastic B cells with abundant basophilic cytoplasm as de demonstrated here. Um, and uh, have uh, the tumor cells have round nucleoli, prominent, uh, prominent nucleoli, perinuclear halos, and show a variable um, nuclear pleomorphism. And we may even encounter rich dumbbell like cells. So um, even though um, I have just mentioned that it's solely um, represented or, or diagnosed in um, cavities as a fusion, there are rare solid variants um, that has been described. And these resemble anaplastic large cell lymphoma and carry a very, very poor prognosis. So another B cell lesion associated with HH rate is Castleman disease. And uh, this is known as giant cell lymph node hyperplasia or angiofollicular lymph node hyperplasia as described by Dr. Benjamin Castleman back in the 1950s. So the initial classification is still the gone standard um, as there has uh, not been a comprehensive review of this pathology. Um, it describes a group of rare disorders with a wide range of, uh, of symptoms, but the histological description has diversified since um, multiple pathogenic, um, pathogenic um, events lead to the development of this disease. And classification-wise, we focus on the plasma cell variant, which is mainly encountered in the um, multicentric, uh, which is a systemic disease form. Um, um, in our daily practice, um, we may encounter biopsies from enlarged thoracic lymph nodes. Um, the histological hallmark of this disease in the lymph nodes is plasma cell infiltrates, onion skinning, and lollipop appearance. Um, as we all have learned during our residency. Um, also, Castleman's disease most commonly occurs in the metastinum pulmonary manifestation um, occurs rarely. Um, and the main pulmonary pathology is rapidly progressing. Interstitial pneumonitis and cyst formation may also be seen on imaging, um, and the patients present with B symptoms. Um, Histologically, the HH3-8-associated plasma cell variant uh, features multiple reactive hyperplastic follicles, uh, which are shown here below, um, with their show marked vascularity, hyaline vascular follicles, and within the interfollicular areas are sheets of plasma cells noted. Um, the HH3-8-infected cells in the mantle zones show plasmablastic or immunoblastic morphology with um, large nuclei, vesicular chromatin, and only these plasma blasts are lambda light chain restricted and HH3-8 positive. So this may be a very focal finding um, and um, may not be widespread. And of course, as always, um, rare cases of cardiac manifestation have been described. <laughs> even though extremely rare and anecdotal. So we come to the next, um, another virus. So that is um, the Epstein-Barr virus, which has an oncogenic potential. Um, the Epstein-Barr virus uh, is a human herpes virus, which may be acquired either as a result of uh, or of primary infection from the donor or uh, environmental exposure. Um, EBV enters its human host via the mucosal route, um, infects and uh, replicates in oropharyngeal epithelial cells, and then infects the B lymphocytes in the oropharynx. Infected B cells are phenotypically indistinguishable from normal B cells and express viral latency at associated proteins that induce B cell proliferation. Um, the infected B cells transition into infected mem um, memory B cells, and virus replication is important for the virus transmission in order to maintain the pool of infected memory B cells, uh, which then um, are able to infect recipient B cells in an organ allograft, in an organ graft. So the recipient carrying a high B cell load are at particular risk for PTLD and CD20 expression appears to predict survival, in particular here in the pediatric um, um, uh, population. Um, this B cell proliferation mainly occurs in lymph node spleen and in the lung mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, uh, which are obviously uh, mostly centered around bronchiovascular bundles. Um, EBV negative um, PTLD occurs in approximately 20 to 30% of patients. 
And as everybody of us has encountered, diagnosis can be extremely challenging in the diagnostic biopsy material due to the limited amount of lesional and EBV infected cells. Um, historically, the WHO classification separated uh, post-transplant lymphoproliferative diseases from lymphoproliferative disease associated with other forms of immunodeficiency, um, such as hydrogenic acquired or congenital. Um, however, um, the spectrum of post-transplant lymphoproliferative diseases has changed in recent years as there are now many different regimens in use for the induction um, of immune suppression or immune tolerance even. So further, a high level of expression of PDL1 could be demonstrated in most lesions. Um, so thus, the classification system into monomorphic, which was a non-destructive variant and polymorphics, the destructive PDLD, did not longer suffice. So therefore, a unifying nomenclature was adopted to enable the study of all of all the entirety of the immune deficiency related lymphoproliferative diseases within a single conceptual framework to enable larger study studies, multicentral one. Um, this nomenclature was introduced during the workshop um, of the European Association for Hematopathology and is based on three parts. So mainly um, the lesion is a hyperplastic, polymorphic, the type of lymphoma according to the WHO classification. Secondly, the presence or absence of one or more oncogenic viruses like EBV, HHV8, et cetera. And thirdly, the immunodeficiency setting is at post-transplant HIV defection, autoimmune atrogenic. So therefore we have now um, names like polymorphic B lymphoproliferative disease, EBV positive autoimmune rheumatoid arthritis, iatrogenic um, in setting. So this is a diagnosis. So therefore, um, it is imperative to consult our um, hematopathology colleagues <laughs> in, um, in the diagnostic setting. So differential diagnosis of mass forming lymphocytic lesion is broad. Um, and uh, includes beside, um, besides epithelial malignancy, also reactive and non-infective benign etiologies as GPA, as dem demonstrated previously by Robert, um, and in cardiac allografts even. The quilty phenomena, if you biopsy very strangely and you have a huge quilty phenomena, which are also B cell positive, not necessarily um, 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 EBV positive, but as we have heard, every fourth case is um, EBV negative, um, then you may be in a pickle. Um, so the diagnosis um, requires not only a multidisciplinary approach, but also clear communication with the clinical colleagues and the oncologists. So once um, the diagnosis of a PTLD is established, there are nowadays different treatment options available. And in fact, Dr. Rosa Bruger from the Great Ormond Street Hospital in London was awarded um, the Young Investigator Award um, at this year's ISHGT meeting um, for presenting um, a diagnostically challenging case of PTLD in an adolescent following lung transplantation. So the patient was treated with ex vivo derived EBV specific cytotoxic T cells which are prepared um, um, from um, the um, bone marrow cells um, with the clinical grade laboratory strain of EBV. So this T cell therapy harbors a lower risk of development of graft versus host disease compared to the um, donor uh, lymphocyte infusions, uh, which are usually applied. So, and finally, I'm going to touch very, very briefly on HPV-related cancers, um, which are more commonly encountered. So, transplant recipients have an elevated cancer risk, including risk of human papilloma virus-associated cancers. So, HPV is associated with atypical squamous proliferations and development of invasive squamous cell carcinomas in various locations, but mainly involving vagina, vulva, cervix, anus, penis, and other oropharynx. Um, and a large US-based study examines the incidence of HPV-related cancers in almost 190,000 transplant uh, recipients in the transplant cancer match study, of which almost 26,000 heart and or lung transplant patients. However, reading through the literature, the tissue was not available to determine the HPV status of the tumors. So as the study was performed under the working hypothesis that transplant-related immunosuppression increases the incidence of HPV. 
So um, incidence rate ratios compared um, the, ratio, um, the rates across transplant subgroups and showed an increase with time since transplant for invasive vulva and anal cancers and for penile carcinoma in situ in heart and or lung transplant recipients. So the use of specific immunosuppressive medications was variably associated with incidence and standardized uh, incidence ratios compared incidence to the general population and for elevated except for invasive cervical cancer. So the absence of increased incidence of invasive cervical cancer was attributed to the success of cervical screening in this population, at least as I postulated that. So histologically, so and here I have given the example of lung since we are talking about lung, uh, separation between carcinoma and situ and invasive squamous cell carcinoma may be difficult, in particular if the biopsy is fragmented, and invasion should be um, invasion should be um, assessed carefully, in particular as the typical squamous perforations may be encountered in the vicinity of inflammatory lesions. Um, unequivocal features of squamous differentiation include keratinization and intercellular bridges and never shy away um, from requesting and repeat biopsy is my advice in clinical practice, in particular if the pathology is uncertain, um, if we are dealing with invasion of lesion or not. Um, currently, the diagnostic workup for squamous cell carcinoma includes in most European countries predictive immunostochemistry for pdl one and the mechanism has nicely been illustrated by uh, my previous speaker. And in conclusion, uh, transmission of viruses with oncogenic potential is a frequent event after organ transplantation, but virus-related morbidity is rather rare, but still can be life-threatening. Virus-related pathology poses significant difficulties in everyday practice and clinical pathological correlation is mandatory. And also, great strides have been made in identification and classification of virus-related malignancy. Uh, we appear to have just scratched the surface of the importance of tumor colonization by microorganisms. So recent research has shown prognostic um, significance um, of a com specific combinations of bacterial and fungal infections on cancer development, um, which has been um, one of the groups is the Weizmann Institute in Israel, which are studying currently um, the bacteria and the, and the fungi. So um, there is much potential also in the heart and lung transplant field, I think, but um, the main um, difficulty is likely um, how to isolate the viruses or how to demonstrate them. So with this, um, I bring my presentation to a close, but before that, I would like to thank uh, Professor Nicholson and Dr. Rice from the Royal Brompton Hospital, Dr. Keen Twy um, from the Royal Marston Hospital, and Dr. Rosa Brugger from the Great Ormond Street Hospital, as well as Professor Wolfram Klapper, who came um, to my aid with a PTLD classification uh, from the University Hospital um, in Kiel, and Professor Corby from the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale for generously sharing the expertise and images with me and for sharing the pertinent literature. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions, uh, whatever, in, in chat or afterwards. Or I'm, I'm not sure how, uh, how much time we have left. I don't want to take from the next presentation. Thank you very much. That was an uh, excellent overview. I think in the interest of time, we will postpone questions. I see one in the chat that we'll get to um, after the next speaker. Um, so moving along, it's it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wansheng Chai Ho, my colleague at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Chai Ho is an assistant professor in the Department of Oncology, and she's going to talk to us about the challenges in the diagnosis and management of cancer and solid organ transplant recipients. Dr. Chai Ho. Yes, I am on. I'm just having a little trouble sharing my screen now. Okay, can you all looks see my good. screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, wonderful. So thanks for having me at the uh, conference today. And it was really inspiring to hear the talk from Dr. Padera and Dr. Wesselu and very educational. And, and like Greg mentioned, I am a medical oncologist. I treat patients with leukemia, lymphoma, and as well as solid malignancy especially at the beginning of my career, I took on a lot of solid organ transplant patients who had a cancer diagnosis. 
and not really by intention, but uh, we practice at UCLA, which is also a large transplant institution. So actually gave me this very unique career background. So happy to share some of my experience and thoughts. This is certainly a challenging topic, just as the patient population that we are seeing, and because of the variety of disease that they can develop after transplant. So here are my disclosures, mostly from the clinical trials that I participated in. Then, so about 20 years ago, and there was a heated debate in an epidemiology as well as solid organ transplant physicians. Is this really a problem that transplant patients would develop cancer or die from cancer? And obviously the advanced. transplant I physicians- mm -hmm. I, don't think you're, I don't know if your slide intended to advance, but it didn't, I didn't see it advance. Okay, I will see what is happening here. Let me maybe... I've minimized this and then try to go back here to reshare my screen. Try to Does this advance now? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I have a double screen, which is a little challenging. So about 20 years ago, it was a heated debate on whether in transplant patients really have increased the risk of cancer or do they die from cancer? And obviously the transplant physicians are fully invested on caring for their patient and want the best outcome of their patient going through heroic solid organ transplant. And then that population is very sick generally with multiple medical comorbidities. So the increased risk of cancer, for example, in our practice that we see two to threefold increased risk of cancer, is that really higher than the general population? And then that was done by a lot of subsequent epidemiology studies. But in general, when we are dealing with post transplant malignancies, they can be recurrence of a prior existing cancer or donor derived cancer or de novo cancer, which accounts for majority of the post-transplant malignancy. So recurrence incidence of pre-existing cancer has been well controlled at a very low level, largely due to the wait time um, of pre-transplant um, post-malignancy diagnosis. So in general, across the board for solid organ transplant, they have been using a five-year cutoff and for all malignancies. And, so that we're able to minimize the post-transplant malignancy recurrence rate at 1.6 per 100 person per year, which is very generally acceptable, especially for colon cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, and the more common type of cancer diagnosis. And so Eric Engel was a, a famous epidemiologist at NIH that had done lots of pivotal and very and carefully designed epidemiology studies. So looking at the standard incidence ratio and an increased mortality rate of immunocompromised patients, specifically including solid organ transplant recipients as well as HIV patient. So here is a figure and portraying the increased incidence of cancer diagnosis in solid organ transplant patients, which is the y-axis, and then also the HIV infected patient population. So we can see the dotted line means there's no difference in the cancer incidence from the gen between the HIV and the solid organ transplant patients. And so virus-related cancers were marked red in this diagram. And we can see that HIV-infected patients tend to have more virus-related cancer, whereas solid organ transplant patients tend to have less of those. And then we can also see the triangles here is marks and cancer diagnosis now are approved to receive immune checkpoint inhibitor, which is a form of immunotherapy that we will talk a little bit in the end. And to be um, to, to, to comment on skin cancer, including squamous cell cancer and basal cell cancer, now also have an approval for immunocheckpoint inhibitor 
this article was published, published in 2019. So from here, we can see that solid organ transplant patients clearly have an increased incidence of cancer uh, comparing to the general population, especially for common cancers for healthy population like skin cancer and basal cell cancer that we tend to think they're harmless cancers. They're incidence is really high up to 50, 100 fold compared to the general population. And whereas other solid organ tr cancers and are generally increased in, in incidence in about you know, one to 10 times. Mm -hmm. And that bring us to dis the discussion of why and solid organ transplant patients develop cancers, I think, and to and lots of pathologists and, and physicians that take care of this patient population, we all know that already immunosuppression really plays a huge role. Generally, when we talked about cancer pathogenesis, mm -hmm. normal cells and undergoes mutations or environmental insult and then develop precancer or cancer cells. And then there is also virus infection, like I mentioned in Dr. Lasalu's presentation, there's HPV, Epstein-Barr virus, and HHV, they can cause cancer. And when patients are immunosuppressed, so our own immune systems are unable to survey the onset of malignancy. There is also some hypothesis and then certain immunosuppressive agents can directly cause cancer, especially when used in combination with antifungal agents like azoles. And then also search immunosuppression increased patients' risk of having virus infection that also increased the incidence of cancer. So prognosis for cancer patients, and then unfortunately that is poor. So this had been studied and then demonstrated in multiple registration trials from different country. For example, data from Australian and New Zealand dialysis and a transplant registry have shown that transplant recipients with breast cancer have an increased mortality of at least 40% compared with women with breast cancer in general population. And for men with colorectal cancer and a kidney, and kidney transplant, the five-year overall survival was 27% comparing to 75% for those in general population with cancer, but no transplant. And a similar study done in the Dutch kidney transplant cohort, the medium survival after diagnosis of cancer was only 2.7 years compared to an average survival of recipients without cancer, which was eight years. So those numbers are significantly different. And then also when we look at Eric and Engel's data and from a multivariate analysis of large epidemiology cohorts, we can see that in certain cancer diagnosis and the incidence of hazard ratio of deaths specifically from cancer comparing to general population was significantly higher than such as melanoma and breast cancer. And then the the red here mark the virus related cancer they tend to have better prognosis. I think part of the hypothesis is Epstein-Barr virus. There is a targeted agent, rituximab, that eliminates B cells, and perhaps and, and can result in a better outcome. And then oral cavity, pharynx cancer, which is HPV-driven, tend to be local. Same for liver cancer, and then when patients have a liver transplant for whichever reason they will be surveyed for liver cancer, perhaps those cancers were more likely to be diagnosed at early stage. This is just an hypothesis. But across the board, in various different type of cancer and in solid organ transplant patients, they all have an increased incidence of death and directly from cancer. And as clinicians, and when we take care of solid organ transplant patients, and they're more likely to be referred to an academic institution because those are challenging patients to care for. They're on a lot of medications, and then we have to be mindful on potential drug-drug interaction. They usually are sick. They might have kidney disease from immunosuppression, induced a kidney failure, and then other comorbidities. And then like Dr. Patera mentioned, that they their transplanted organ might have limited tolerability to chemotherapy or radiation. 
And then when we choose a therapy for them, especially considering immunotherapy, which is so promising in many different types of solid work and uh, or different type of cancers in general, and then they can unleash organ rejection, which is a big no-no for a transplant patient. And then those patients and can also have significant cytopenia because of polypharmacy. Their tolerance to chemo in general is poor. When they're cytopenic, they might develop infection. And then many patients were diagnosed with cancer at a late stage of disease, and then which becomes a challenge to, tra- to, to treat. And a lot of cancer in solid organ transplant patients who are undergoing immunosuppression have a very aggressive behavior of their cancer. And then lastly, but not the least, and the many transplant patients come to transplant center for transplant, and, you know, far away from a major academic center. And then when we develop cancer, we're not just talking about six months, one year commitment to frequent care, but it's more of a day-to-day management of side effects. It really becomes a struggle for some patient to receive quality cancer care at trusted and accountable institutions. And so I'd like to focus the second part of my uh, presentation on one specific type of cancer, not super relevant to heart and lung transplant and heart and lung pathology, but this is really common, and which is skin cancer, specifically squamous cell carcinoma. So non-melanomatous skin cancers are the most common type of post-transplant malignancies and then arise from 50% of the Caucasian transplant patients and cutaneous squamous cell cancer and a basal cell cancer accounts for more than 90% of all cases of a non-melanomatous skin cancers. The rest can be Merkel cells or carpal sarcomas. In comparison to the general population, the risk for a transplant patient to develop a cutaneous malignancy is 65 to 200 fold higher for developing cutaneous squamous cells and then 10 times higher for developing basal cell carcinoma. Whereas in general population, we see more of a basal cell than squamous cell carcinoma. And a non-melanomatous skin cancer in solid organ transplant recipients tend to behave more aggressively with local recurrence, distant metastases, and then so many patients end up needing systemic therapy after exhausting local therapy. So this is in, in great contrary to this type of cancer in the general patient population. Management of recurrent metastatic non-melanomatous skin cancer, I think first and foremost, really requires reducing a reduction of immunosuppression because skin is the largest organ that cover our body, constantly exposed to various toxins, UV light. And we all know that cutaneous squamous cell cancer has a very high mutation burden and so which makes them sensitive to immunosuppression, the immunotherapy, immune activating therapy. So by reducing patients' immunosuppression alone, sometimes would significantly reduce patient skin cancer recurrence risk. And we could offer those patient chemotherapy, such as platinum, taxane, 5-FU, which are used to treat various type of cancer. And then epidermal growth factor receptor targeted agents are also promising to treat skin cancer because this marker is overexpressed in the skin. And I also want to talk a little bit about immune checkpoint inhibitor. Dr. Padera mentioned a lot in his presentation. So this traditionally was considered an absolute contraindication. And, but people, we keep trying because the results of immune checkpoint inhibitor on cutaneous skin cancer, especially squamous cell cancer, looks so promising. So this is a class of drugs that unleash the suppressed T cells ability to fight cancer by blocking the pd one and the pd one communication, therefore activates a um, tumor cell. And so and right now we have multiple agents blocking PD-1 and the pd one And those are drugs like Kichuda, Pembrolizumab, Nibolumab, and then Sibimpilumab, and also a pd one agents. So this is data from the simiflumab clinical trial, which is a PD-1 antibody, an incutaneous skin cancer. So on this plot, and any number below the zero line means the patient is having a response. As we can see that the patients, this is a non-transplant patient, non-immunocompromised patient. 
CR rate is about 70% for all those patients who will have a clinical complete response. And then 90% of the patient will have a clinical benefit re with reduction of tumor size. And then figure B here is the duration of response and on the forest plot, and then we can see the ongoing gray arrows or it indicates ongoing response. So for patients who responded to immune checkpoint inhibitor, which activates their immune system, their response is durable. So that's why, because the response is so encouraging as an oncologist and then some transplant physicians at certain institution, we kept trying on delivering this type of medication to our transplant patients. So there are some ongoing trials that I cited here and the study how to deliver immune checkpoint inhibitor safely in solid organ transplant patients. And in general, and before those trials came to play, and then the risk of organ rejection after immune checkpoint inhibitor is about 40%. This is a pretty high number, and out of which 70% led to graft failure. If the patient had a kidney transplant, it's somewhat easy to con convince the patient to go back onto dialysis. Whereas if the patient had a heart, a lung, liver transplant, there's really no salvage for the transplanted organ failure. So it's a big risk for the patient and the transplant physician to take on. But some emerging strategies such as using prophylactic steroid and preemptively convert patient to mTOR inhibitor are allowing the checkpoint inhibitor use to, to be safer and also certain strategy to detect the, <clears throat> the level of mismatch and pre and post transplant circulating donor derived DNAs to help to predict their outcome after immune checkpoint in inhibitor. So those are things on the horizon. And we might start to see more patients receiving immune checkpoint inhibitor after transplant. And then in cutaneous skin cancer, there are some exciting new therapy and on the horizon that are targeted immunotherapy to a local area. For example, and we are um, participating in a clinical trial called Articus, is using intratumor injection of immune modulating oncolytic virus, RP1. So this virus and is and displayed here, sorry, the graph is very small, but basically is a genetically modified HSV1 virus, knocked out the pathogenic portion, but the virus can continue to replicate. And then we insert GMCSF into the virus, which can cause a local inflammatory environment at wherever site the and virus was injected into. The risk of such approach is it can cause HSV1 reactivation, but theoretically patients should not develop disease because the pathogenic portion on the virus was knocked out, but it will allow the GMCSF to um, have ongoing amplification. And this clinical trial was done enrolling initially only kidney and a liver transplant patient after initial phase of safety evaluation. And then they are now open to heart and lung transplant patients as well as hematopoietic stem cell transplant patient as well. So in the trial is allowing cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma patient as well as non-CSCC patients we enrolled, which includes melanoma, Merkel cell, basal cell carcinoma, and then now expanding to couple C sarcoma as well. So this virus injected into palpable or an ultrasound and detectable lesions, superficial lesions once every two weeks. From our experience, this is well tolerated. I think their preliminary data was just published and presented this June at the American Transplant Society meeting in San Diego. And we are waiting on the final readout on efficacy. So this might become a promising strategy for solid organ transplant patient. So this, um, the same vector and the same strategy is currently approved for melanoma, which the drug is called TVAC. So we're hoping can expand it to a population with significant MET need. And lastly, and we cannot just talk about cancer treatment without talking about prevention strategy. And I think the most important is selecting the appropriate transplant recipient. And if they have a history of cancer, 
and especially, and now we're paying extra attention to cutaneous cancer as well. And there is guideline written out from American Transmit Society on the wait period needed for patients with different type of pre-transplant skin and malignancy, and based on their pathological feature, nodal status, and et cetera. And also reducing immunosuppression preemptively in standard practice. And one year success post-transplant, I think, is not our goal, not the goal for a transplant physician. Ultimately, we really want the patient to have a functional, good quality of life many years down the road from transplant. And one of those strategies on reducing immunosuppression in kidney transplant is to induce an immune tolerance. And right now, across the board and many academic institutions, there are tolerance strategies of also infusing donor hematopoietic stem cell to kidney transplant recipient and to achieve a post-transplant chimerism, and therefore patient can be off immunosuppression all along. And then we can see how that impact and patients and cancer incidence. There was a lot of discussion on nicotinamide, which is an oral and active form of vitamin B3. It is a precursor of a nicotinamide adenine dinucleolide dinucleotide, which is an essential cofactor for ATP production. And nicotinamide can prevent ATP depletion and a glycolytic blockade induced by UV radiation, therefore boosting the cellular energy and enhancing DNA repair. And in the initial trial published on New England Journal many years ago, nicotinamide taken orally 500 milligrams twice a day had very little side effects really well tolerated and help to reduce the onset of recurrent cutaneous skin cancer and basal cell cancer by two to three cancer per year. And we, we thought it is you know, practice changing, especially for the immunocompromised patient who has lots of recurrent skin cancer. However, the data published earlier this year on New England Journal specifically in transplant patient and immunocompromised patient was negative. There was a lot of talk about why this was a negative trial, perhaps in the really high risk patients are already taking nicotinamide under standard of care and instead of participating in the trial. And the trial took a long time to enroll and in the end it was closed early and due to slow enrollment. So many different reasons. And even though the data show this negative, but in my practice, I still discuss with my patients who had a recurrent post-transplant skin cancer. And it's very benign, well tolerated. And then it's also unclear if cancer screening can improve the cancer treatment outcome and facilitate an early diagnosis. I think in liver transplant, they do that routinely for liver cancer. There seems to be a role, but it's unclear for breast cancer or colon cancer, should we move up the screening timeline for those patients? I think we need more data on that. And lastly, and lots of data suggest that using an mTOR inhibitor can help to reduce um, tumor genesis. So perhaps this is something to consider for the transplant physician as well. And it has been a long journey for solid organ transplant. And then in, in, in the past, and I don't think that many patients could come to see oncology, even discuss treatment options, but hopefully with and all that we do in prevention and early diagnosis, and we can help those patients to have a better outcome after a solid organ transplant. Okay, I can also take questions and then not sure how we are doing on time. Yes, we can start from a question that was written in the chat, but I see that it has already been answered. And it was about the differential diagnosis between PTLD and an acute rejection in the post-transplant biopsy and uh, the diagnostic approach um, shared and agreed was that uh, a minimal minimum uh, of uh, antibodies to achieve a diagnosis, uh, ABER, and then also uh, molecular tests and overall multidisciplinary team discussion is uh, required. I think that we have also time for at least one question for the last presentation. 
I was just wondering, uh, uh, Dr. Chai, if you're aware of any uh, studies on the, the use of donor-derived cell-free DNA in these patients, given that now there are circulating tumor cells. I know that uh, if in pregnancy, that it doesn't seem to, it's not an indication. Is there any contraindication in a tumor in a patient with a cancer? I think that's a great question. It certainly is challenging when the patient had a solid organ transplant, what type of DNA are we detecting? And I am not aware of any data using circulating DNA in solid organ transplant patient with cancer diagnosis. I, I, as, as far as I can think of, certain circulating DNAs are targeted on tumor. For example, we have NAVDAX targeting P16 or HPV, and DNA derivatives for head and neck cancer. And I don't see a contraindication for that type of circulating DNA to be used in diagnosing cancer. We still do circulating tumor DNA sequencing for patients that we want to evaluate tumor mutations, but they don't have sufficient tissue. And I also don't see that as a problem as long as we can detect the circulating DNA. Um, but recently, we had a bone marrow transplant patient developed a lung failure, undergone a lung transplant, and the data in that setting was really difficult to interpret because you were analyzing different donor DNAs. Okay, if there are uh, no questions anymore, I think that we can move to the end of this great webinar. And let me remind you of three important upcoming events. The first one is the Pathology Professional Community Town Hall that will be held in August the 16th at 2 p.m. And the second one, the next Cardiology Professional Community webinar on September the 27th. Uh, let me also thank Professor Fishben and all the speakers for their contributions today. Uh, thank you everyone who joined us uh, um, for uh, the webinar and a special thank you to the society. I hope you will join this organization if you are not a member yet. And if you want to, more, to know more about the society, you can visit the official website and see you at the next event. And thank you all, goodbye.